Mr. Crew is a graduate of the school, a parent in the school, a teacher of Mod, and a very well respected lawyer in the community. And we're very honored to have him as the first speaker to kick off the series. And without further ado, Okay, so first off, uh, thank you to Shifra and thank you to, uh, to Jack and the commission and his fellow commissioners for inviting me to be here this morning. Um, I, I had a problem. Let's start this way. I had a problem. I was about um, six or seven years into my practice. I was working at a big firm in Manhattan. And like many other large law firms, they had a rule. And the rule was if you wanted a bonus at the end of the year, right? You had to build bill 2,000 hours. Okay, so doesn't sound like a lot. You guys are probably in this school more than 2,000 hours, but when you think about a day, right, and you think about all the things you have to do as a normal person during a day, to actually sit down and do legal work for clients that the clients are going to pay the law firm for and have it be 2,000 hours a year is pretty hard. It's hard for anybody. It becomes even harder. When you can't work on Shabbat, you have to leave early half the year on Fridays, and you uh, are off for holidays, you're off for whatever you may need to do, um, it becomes even harder. There's just so many hours in the day, and there's only so many uh, opportunities you have to actually sit down and do your work. So uh, thankfully, I, so when, since I started my career, I was very, very busy, so I never really had a problem hitting the two thousand hours. Usually my problem was the opposite. I was building too many hours. Um, I can honestly say, and this is not to scare anybody from legal practice, but I, I re honestly don't have any recollection of my oldest son's first year of life. I was on a big case. I was in Detroit maybe 20 times over the course of six months. And that's just the reality. You want to work at a prestigious law firm. You want to work on um, important cases, high value cases. You're going to have to make sacrifices. And one of the sacrifices had always been in my career that you're working too many hours. And which is great. I mean, they reward you, right? You get your bonus at the end of the year, and it's a lot of money, right? It's the difference between being able to pay for school, uh, being able to go on vacation, being able to uh, have nice things. Uh, so that's kind of the way it works. So my problem was very simple. I had been very busy at the start of the year. I was actually staffed on 12 cases, and if anybody Anybody who's taken my class knows how complicated patent cases are. That's a lot. That's a lot of cases to be on. And then all of a sudden, so I was cruising. I was building like a maniac. I was working like a, like a dog. And uh, the hours were coming, and I was set up for a really nice bonus at the end of the year because the way my firm worked was, every hundred hours you build over two thousand, you could be eligible for even more money. So the more hours, think of it as like a, uh, a sports contract incentives, right? If I rush for 1,000 yards, I get an extra million bucks. If I rush for 2,000 yards, I'm going to get 5 million bucks. It's not that big money, but that's the idea. <laughs> so um, all of a sudden, one after one after one, every single one of my cases, except for two, settled. Out of nowhere, just complete, like we won on a motion, the case went away, the other side gave up, everybody gave up. So now, I went from being unbelievably busy to actually having a life, which is great. Um, and the first month after all your cases settle and you have kind of a nice November and you can go away for Thanksgiving, you're, you're feeling great. But then I started looking at my hours and I'm going into December and it's going to be really, really hard to get to 2000. All right. We might not think that that's an ethical dilemma, but that's actually probably the number one ethical dilemma that lawyers have to face. No one is watching you when you sit at the end of every day or at the end of every week or at the end of every month and you go on the computer and you put in how much time you worked on a particular case. All right, we had software that did that. Um, they try to, you know, they try to tie it to our web browser and tie it to your phone system. It never works. At the end of the day, it was up to each lawyer in the firm, and this goes for any law firm around the country that bills hours. You have to sit there and you have to type into a computer, I worked on this client and I spent two hours on this and here's what I did that day. And no one's looking over your shoulder. And if you think about it, um, the law firm, the people that are paying you, they actually want you to build more hours. 
right? They want you to go all the way up to the line of billing as honestly as you can, but be generous about it, right? They don't want you to give the client the benefit of the doubt. Why? Because that, that's how the whole firm gets paid, right? So whenever you have a system, and when we talk about ethics, the way I like to think about ethics is ethics are really, it's not about following the rules because that's the difference between doing something legal and illegal, right? If I go to somebody's pocket and I take something out of their pocket, I'm just stealing from them. But when I put down that I worked an hour and a half on a brief or on an, on an email or on a memo, and it really took me an hour, is that really stealing? Is that the same thing as going into somebody's pocket? Maybe, maybe not, and there, there's a final line. But when we think about ethics, I want you guys to keep this in mind. Ethics is about how we behave when we have full control. When no one can tell us what to do, no one can stop us from doing what we want to do, and we have every incentive to maximize our self-advantage over the responsibility we have to other people. Okay? So that's going to be kind of our working definition. But before we get into more, does everybody understand the concept of billing hours and why it could be a very ethically challenging yeah. endeavor, right? Yeah. You're sitting there, you're doing work, you're keeping track of your work, but no one's really telling you at the end of the day. Now, another part of the problem and another thing that makes ethics challenging, particularly in business practice, is if you looked around the firm, if you went on my floor, so everybody on my floor was, uh, was also a patent or an IP lawyer, you could pretty much tell who the cheaters were. They were the people that rolled in at 10 o'clock, left at 6 o'clock, and then for some reason were still managing to bill 10 hours a day. Right? You're only in the office 10 hours. There's no way you're billing every minute you're in the office. You went to lunch, you sat on the phone, you checked your fantasy football, you did a million other things, right? Um, but somehow there were certain people that were, we call them creative billers, and they were really, really good at making sure that they always hit their targets. They always got the 200 hours a month, they always got the 2,000 hours a year. So that's the framework that a lot of lawyers operate in. And one of the things that makes ethics hard is when you see the cheaters around you, you know how they say cheaters never prosper? <laughs> the hard part is, is that they always do prosper. Yeah. You, when you look at them, you see them prospering. What's the you see, uh, until they get caught, but you're not around when they get caught. You don't really care when they get caught, right? If you go, uh, so when we, so to give you an example, the bonus checks used to come in on December 31st, right? The end of the year, for tax reasons, the firm had to pay everybody their bonuses at the end of the year. Okay, so we all used to sit around, there's no work, it's New Year's Eve, there's no work, no one's doing anything. So we all used to sit in the office, and uh, somebody would open a bottle of scotch, and everybody would tell stories, and we'd all have a great time. Nurse Avis to the office, please, Leon. Nurse Avis to the office, please. But the, but the only reason you're there is to get your check. All right? Now imagine you know how hard you worked all year, and you know that you, you killed yourself. You got to 2,100 hours for the year, and your bonus that year is going to be $25,000. The guy sitting next to you, that you know, you're, you see him every day, not working, showing up late, putting down fake time, he walks out and he's like, look, I got 50 grand. Why? Because he, was, he built 2,300 hours. When you're seeing that on that day, on December 31st, that's the hardest time to think that you know, being ethical pays off, because you see a cheater prosper. Now, three years down the road, when it's time to make partner, and you're the only one making partner because everybody respects your work and everybody knows you're honest and everybody knows you're ethical, that's a different story. And this person may already be out on the street or working at another firm or you know, finding their way. But you don't really care about that then, right? What influences your behavior is when you see them prospering in the moment. And that's one of the challenges of behaving ethically. Okay, so let's talk about how lawyers learn ethics, right? It's very important. It's actually a requirement in law school that you take an ethics course. Before you can take the bar exam, you have to take a special part that's only on ethics. And basically what lawyers learn is that the best way to learn about ethics is to look at all the bad things that other people have done 
and try to learn from them, see what they did wrong, and see how you can avoid that situation in the future. Okay. Now, one thing that I think is very interesting is that when we have a class in law school about ethics, the name of the class is not legal ethics. The name of the class is professional responsibility. And I think that's a great way for all of us to think about ethics and to think because it has nothing to do with law. It has to do with who we are and who are we responsible to. So I'm going to ask you guys a question. If you're a lawyer, tell me one type of person you have a responsibility to. A client. Good. Who else? Do you firm, right? The law firm that employs you. Who else? Judge. Huh? Somebody said the judge? The judge. The judge. Okay, so that we call, we, we use the term the court, that a lawyer is an officer of the court. <laughs> really, your responsibility is to the legal profession, right? Because if everybody believes that lawyers are crooks, it completely undermines the rule of law. Somebody else. There's a fourth person that you have an ethical obligation to. Yourself. Yourself. Excellent. Yourself. So you have, we have a hierarchy. All right, yeah, and then let's make it a fifth, because we're all Jews. What's the fifth? God. Yeah. Hashem. We'll say to, to, to Kiddush Hashem, to the idea of Kiddush Hashem, right? That you're a Jew, you're in the workplace, people are watching you, so you have an extra obligation to act as a proper Jew should. Okay, so we have five levels of responsibility. Now, whenever we have levels of responsibility, there's always a question of how do we rank them? And what's most important? Yeah. Yourself is most important. You might think so, but imagine, forget about law, okay? You're a doctor, you're a surgeon, okay? You're called in for an emergency surgery on Sunday. There's a person on the table, they need their, uh, I don't know, spleen removed, otherwise they're gonna, whatever. You can't stop the surgery in the middle because the Giants are playing and you wanna watch the game, right? Why? Your obligation is to yourself. You might have a, a lot of money riding on the game or you might, you know, you might care about the Giants more than anything else. Because you are in what we call a service profession, where you took an oath to help other people, your obligation is always to the person that you're helping above your own interests, okay? So that's, it's a good point, and it's a good way to think about things, but I want to draw a distinction between what we call a service profession and where we have a professional responsibility to a client and where we don't. Okay, so let's go back to lawyers. If you are a lawyer, your number one responsibility is always to the interests of the client over yours. Your responsibility is always to the interests of the client over your responsibility to your law firm. Your interests to the client are, more, are, are higher than your responsibility even to the court. And we have rules in place, we call the model rules, which are the ethical rules, which tell you that, right? And how do we describe it? We say, imagine you're a criminal lawyer and you're trying to defend someone accused of a crime. You have to be, even if you believe that this guy is the most guilty guy in the world, yeah, he's on video going into the store and taking out the TV, right? You still have a duty of what we call zealous advocacy about his, uh, to him. What that means is you can't make a joke in front of the prosecutor about how this guy is guilty. You can't, if the judge says, your client's guilty, and you know we all know your client's guilty. You can't just sit there and, and ha ha and chuckle. You have to defend this guy's rights to the limit of your ethical obligation. You have to sit there and you have to think, how can I argue? Maybe the video is wrong. Maybe the timestamp is wrong. Maybe he actually paid for it. Maybe he took the TV to his car and then was going to come back and pay the credit card with his credit card and the meter maid, he got into a fight with the meter maid and then whatever it may be, come up with whatever story you are. Your obligation is always to your client, right? First, which is hard. We're not used to that. We always think, what do you mean my obligation is to my client? What do you mean I can't bill more time in December, right? Advance hours. Right, so let, let's go back to my situation, right? Let's say I needed, I actually finished the year, that year, with 1,978 hours, okay? It's very easy at any time when you're working on a patent case, you guys who are in my class know, there's so many issues, there's so much stuff to do. For me to just advance 20 hours from my January work to December, I'm not saying to lie, I'm not saying to put down 22 hours that I didn't do. I'm just saying start the work a week early, right? Just come in on Christmas Day, right, which the firm's always open. They're always well ready for you to build. <laughs> the firm's open 
um, coming on Christmas Day and something that I know I might need to do in January, start doing it in December so I get the hours in December. That would be an ethical violation because the client doesn't need it. Why would it be an ethical violation? Why can't I just advance time and do the work? No one's saying, we're not talking in here, when we talk about ethics, we're not talking about things that are so obviously wrong that they would fall into the line of crime, right? Charging someone for something I didn't do, that's a crime. That's the same thing as me going and pocket stealing. I'm talking about something as nuanced as advancing hours. Why do you think that might be a problem? Yes. The work's not needed now. The work's not needed now. That was even worse. It's like you care more about yourself than your client. Well, okay. So that, that's that's a very ethical way to put it, right? That I'm putting my interests ahead of my client's interests. But think about it. Let's say I did the work. Let's say I started working on a motion. And then for whatever reason, let's say I was working on a motion. This happens all the time. Lawyers, we like to send document requests and stuff to the other side. We want information. We want documents. And then the other lawyer always makes some you know, nonsense excuses about why they can't give me the documents or they make me wait too long. And then my client gets mad, why don't you have their documents? So we file a motion to compel their documents. Let's say I started working on that motion to compel because I've been, been, been on this case for two years. I know the lawyers on the other side. I know they're lazy. I know they're not going to do anything unless the court tells them to do. So I'll start working on the motion to compel in December because I know I'm going to end up having to file it the first week of January can't do that because maybe maybe a miracle happens and they actually send me the documents in January and I don't need to file the motion even just advancing work is already starting to skirt the line of what you're doing so again our number one responsibility and this goes for law and I think it goes for any service profession your number one responsibility is to the client your teachers their responsibility are you you guys right the administrators, their responsibility is you guys. You're a doctor, you're a lawyer, you're an accountant, doesn't matter what you end up doing, your obligation is always going to be to your client first, even and especially when it conflicts with your own interest. Okay, good. Now, what about, what about when it's actually easier to cheat, right, than it is to do the right thing? What do we, what resources do we have or can we call on to make sure that we police ourselves? Because remember, what a, remember my example. In my example, there is no way for the firm or for the client to know that me putting down these extra hours is, is somehow wrong, is not necessary. I could very easily justify starting to work on the motion this summer. I could tell, look, I'm, I'm gonna be winter vacation, I'm gonna be in Disney with my kids, so I wanted to make sure I did it before I got busy preparing for vacation. Whatever it may be. There's no, the only policing we're talking about is self-policing. So how do we conquer that? So, now here's where the halakha part comes in. Here's where the halakha part comes in. If you look at, yeah. I don't understand, why would they let people, like, if it's that easy to make up hours, I know you should, but like, why would that be the company's policy? Because remember, the firm makes money when clients pay the bills. So the firm, so actually, I'll tell you something. When we were first hired, right, when they first hired the new crop of associates from law school, they have training. It's like an orientation. And I'll never forget this. One of the lawyers, who was the head of the, one of the practices, said, I want you people to learn one thing about our building policy at this firm. If you, meaning all you young lawyers that don't know anything, think you can decide what to bill a client, we're gonna fire you. That is a fireable offense. When you're at work and you work on a client's matters, you bill the time and it's up to the partners to decide how much of that time to pass on to the client, what to put the bill. So if you're, a, and I've seen it, I've seen it firsthand. I've seen lawyers that didn't bill enough, not because they weren't doing the work, but because they couldn't figure out or they try to self-police themselves too much. Right? They said, all right, I've seen lawyers that, let's say it took them 10 hours to write a motion, and they heard from somebody else that that motion was easy and they should have only taken five hours, and they only put down five hours, right? Even though they actually worked 10, okay? That, that adds up. And if you're at 1,600, 1,700, even 1,800 hours at a firm like the one I was working at, they're gonna fire you. So what the firm is teaching
teaching you, because it's in the firm's interest, is put down the 10 hours. And then the partner, when he sends the bill to the client, he'll decide whether or not it's appropriate to bill the, part, you know, the client for the 10 hours as opposed to the five hours. So in, in a, to a certain extent, you're also relying on other people to behave ethically, right? Just like a, the partner, when he sends out the bill, he can't take your hours and round it up, right? If you put down 11 hours, he can't say, all right, well, it's 11, but you know, on, on a scale of one to 20, I'll round it up to 20. He can't get time for you either, right? So remember, everybody in the chain has an ethical responsibility, okay? So that's, I think that's pretty clear. What, oh yeah. So you're not really cheating anyone because if you put down, let's say, 10 hours to add up to the 2,000, they don't take down, let's say, five hours. They wouldn't take down five hours from you. They would just take out five hours from the bill. Yeah, but then I'm not going to get, they, they, it has to be billable hours, right? So if I'm working on a speech, right, I, they, and the firm can't charge that to the client, they don't count those hours. You have to keep track of it. Oh, they don't count your 10 hours if they don't bill it? It's a business. They only care about the money. The money that they collect by billing your time. Your, your hourly rate is $500 an hour. You bill 2,000 hours a year. We want to collect $1 million per associate from clients, right? So, yes, I, I mean, I understand you're better off putting down all the time you spend on work, but from the point of view of getting that bonus at the end of the year, they're going to be like, all right, thank you so much, but really, no thank you, right? Remember, they're not in the business to share their money with the associates. They only give bonuses, maybe this is good content. Most of the firms only give bonuses because the other firms are giving bonuses. So it's, it's like, a, you know, it's like a, a group, right? They don't want to lose the good people to another firm because they were cheap on the bonuses. So everybody gives bonuses. Most of the big firms give bonuses. And they always, so for some reason, it always happens to be that the amount they give is the same, <laughs> right? So it's, it's part of the, that's part of the, you know, the game that they play. All right. Let's take a step back and let's take a look at the Rambam. So... I happen to be learning Hilcho Geneva, and in the laws of Geneva, the Rambam is talking about scales, right? You know, there's, there's two mitzvot in the Torah that you have to have proper scales, and that you're not allowed even to own a false weight, right? Even having a weight that, like, says two pounds on it, but really only weighs one pound, is the same, right? From the Torah, okay. So Rambam says, whenever you're doing business, right, someone's coming to your store, they're buying grapes to put on the thing, and let's say you're selling them a pound of grapes. You should always add a little bit more in the customer's favor. Always. That's the, that's the rule, right? He doesn't, he has no source for it. He has no, he doesn't bring you a pasuk. He doesn't bring you a denapana. He doesn't bring you anything. He just says, whenever you're measuring things out, always give the benefit of the doubt to the customer. And what's the, and what is that? How does that translate into ethical behavior in law or in any other practice? It means when you have a question, an ethical question, always defer to your ranking of responsibilities. And remember, in law, our responsibilities are always primarily the client. So the number one guide for your behavior always has to be, is this what benefits the client or is this what benefits me? Because if the answer is it doesn't benefit the client, Maybe it benefits the client. I'm not sure if it benefits the client. You probably shouldn't do it, right? And when you can actually say to yourself, actually, I know this benefits me and I'm gonna do it anyway, that's the worst, right? That's when you're really running into trouble and going over the ethical line. All right, so that's another thing to keep in mind. According to the Rambam, when a Jew is behaving in business, you always want to give the benefit of the doubt to the customer, the person paying your bills. It doesn't matter if you run a store on MUJ, if you're a lawyer, if you're a doctor, you always should be giving a little bit more. And I think it's wonderful advice because what it does is it trains you. You start to realize what's the, what's the biggest reason that lawyers fail ethically? It's not because they're dishonest, it's not because they're corrupt. There are dishonest lawyers, there are corrupt lawyers, there are guys that just steal clients' money. That's for sure. We're not talking about those people. The number one reason why most lawyers get into trouble is because they're distracted thinking about their own interest 
and they don't think about the client. They forget about the client. Yes. I know you said the thing like you have to put your client on top of everyone else, but at the end of the day, you're the one that's making money, and it's for yourself. So I don't know how like that in, like intervenes with like if you want to. It means that you might have to be you might have to settle for something less that year. You might have to go that year without getting a bonus, right? That's the hard part. That's the hard part. It's really easy when you're, you have so many hours that you don't know what to do with them and you know you're going to get a big bonus. Those are the easy years. That, that, that's the, the equivalent of a class where you know you're going to get 100 no matter how much work you put into it. The harder ones are the ones that you know it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of effort and you're probably not even going to get a 90. You're going to end up with an 88, which is the worst, right? 88 is the worst grade or 99 is the worst grade, right? Because you, you should have gotten it and you didn't get it, right? So, but, but, but it's a good point to the extent that it's very important to understand how far our responsibilities to clients go. I'll give you an example. Let's say I have to take a business trip. Okay, I'm going to uh, I'm going to Korea. I'm negotiating with Samsung to settle a case. My wife goes, "Where are you going?" I'm going on a business trip. Why? I can't tell you. I can't tell you, right? Now, if I was going to Samsung to make a speech, I could tell her I'm going on a speech, I'm going to go to Samsung and whatever, we're going to have a great time in Korea. Um, but if I'm going for a reason that's confidential, and by telling her I'm breaking client confidentiality in some respect, I can't tell anybody. I can't tell my wife, I can't tell my kids, I can't write it down, I can't talk about it on the phone while I'm on the subway. I can't do anything that violates client confidentiality. Now, that's an ex that might be an extreme example, but let's say, and this happens, this has happened to me. I get hired, I, I generally tend not to work for Syrian companies um, for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons I don't do work for a lot of Syrian companies is because I don't wanna have to face people and talk about what they do or with anybody. So I had a situation once where I actually was representing one of my friend's businesses in the patent case. It was the hardest thing in the world. I said, never again. I can't talk about what I'm doing for them. Even if they're talking to other people and they're like, oh, guess it's great. I hired them. We're winning. We're kicking butt. We're doing whatever we got to do. I cannot violate client confidentiality. Now, imagine how complicated that is, okay, when this person's wife tells my wife, I heard Gaston and blah, blah, blah were in California together on the case. And my wife has to sit there and say, I, I don't know what you're talking about. It's embarrassing to her. And I know it's embarrassing to her. But my obligation as a lawyer is to behave ethically and not to violate client confidentiality. Yeah. What if he doesn't mind? If he's telling everyone it's the same thing. Not necessarily. Maybe he told his wife. But maybe he didn't want me to tell my wife. Maybe he doesn't want to be embarrassed when he sees my wife in, in Flatbush Yeshiva when they're walking around. Are there yeah. like any agreements or like contracts you could sign to let, like for him to let you tell people? And to no, you can't violate. He, he, can, he can waive. You can waive the attorney-client privilege. You're, you're yeah. right in that respect. But when it comes to these types of things where it's not necessarily privilege, it's just a matter of how ethical do you want to be and how close to the line do you want to you know, go, there's not really, it's not really something you talk about. I can't call my friend, uh, I'll take the case for you, but I want permission to tell my friends, you know, all our mutual friends, if we're at a party and deal, I gotta be able to talk about your case. No one's gonna do that, you can't do that, right? Mm -hmm. And you can't say, I need to be able to talk to my wife. That's not in my engagement letters. In my engagement letters, it doesn't say, if you hire me, you're giving me permission to tell my wife what I do. And I'll tell you honestly, um, the good thing about following the ethical rules is it's the best excuse in the world, right? Not only do you end up feeling good black about it, white. it's black and white. It's black and white. By now, I've been practicing law. I graduated law school in 2001. So my wife knows. Don't even bother asking me about, um, you know, about a case or what I'm doing. If I can tell her, if it's something public, I'm happy to talk about it, right? Because a lot of things that we do, once the case is filed, it's public. And if I get hired as the lawyer, it might be public. So I'm happy to talk about what's public, but if it's something confidential, I'm just not going to talk about it. Yeah. To what extreme are you able to violate it? Like if it like involves like murder or something like that. Okay, so there is a law, there is a rule. I'm not a criminal lawyer at all, but there is a rule that if you know someone else, it's the same thing as like a therapist or a rabbi. If you know that someone's about to commit a crime, you might have a duty to disclose it. 
Okay? And what do lawyers normally do? Right, but let me give you another example. Let's say we're, we're in a case and the lawyer wants you to tell the other side something wrong. That's a, that's a lot, right? Let's say, um, you know, in patent cases, right? If you infringe on somebody's patents and you knew of the other person's patents before, you could be liable for treble damages. Meaning if you owe a million dollars and it's proved that you did the infringement willfully, the court can treble it to $3 million. So you have $2 million incentive to not be a willful infringer. And let's say the client says, we never heard of this other guy's patents. And then as you're going through their documents, as you're going through the case, you find out that they actually do. They actually knew about it. One of the salesmen was in China and saw the product, and whatever it may be, right? And you tell the client, client, there's an email between your salesman and your factory. It's not privileged. There's no lawyer on the email. We have to let the other side know that you knew about the patent. Or I have an interrogatory response where the other side asks questions and I have to sign my name that everything we're saying is right. And the client says, no, you can't admit it. What do I do in that situation? I can't lie, right? I can't, but at the same time, I have a duty of confidentiality. I have a duty of, to my client. I can't ruin things for my client. So what do you think I would have to do in a situation like that? Yeah, Take yourself off. yeah try to withdraw. And not only that, here's how far it goes. When I want to withdraw, and you have to file a motion to withdraw because of, co corporations are not allowed to act in court by themselves. They always need a lawyer. So usually a judge won't let you come out of the case unless there's another lawyer willing to come in, right? So it could be problematic. I can't even tell the judge that the reason I want to withdraw is because the client wants me to lie. I have to make up another reason. Well, yeah, it's but still lying. Like, huh? But it's still so lying. Another reason, kind of. But remember, I have an obligation yeah. to the court. Yeah. But my obligation to my client is higher. Because if I tell the judge that my client's a crook and is about to lie, that's going to kill them in every other part of the case going forward. Why can't you just not? There's eventually so you, a lawyer you can try to not give a reason. But you always, I'm not saying it's a lie. You can't have to make up a reason. But you have to say things like, we have an like a divorce. We have an irreconcilable difference of opinion. Or I, I'm not happy with something else. But you can't, that's how far as it goes. You, you know that what your client is doing is wrong and you want to do the right thing and get out of the case so you don't have to make that hard decision. You still have to care about what the client says. And not only that, five years later, when you're in front of a high school class and you're talking about ethics, you're not allowed to say, this was the client that wanted me to lie. You're not allowed. It, it never, the obligations never die. So what does it compare to? What is it compared to? This should be very obvious to you guys. All the halakha is, is telling us that we have a responsibility that we can't get rid of. The same way as a lawyer has a responsibility to a client, you're a Jew, you have a responsibility to yourself, to your neshama, to Hashem, to your family, to your forefathers, to everybody, to act as a Jew in the workplace. Now, it's not so easy, but that's why we have reward and punishment, right? It's not so easy to act as a Jew. It's not so easy to say, you know what? I'm going to make a Kiddush Hashem because I'm going to be known as the guy that never bills an hour incorrectly. As opposed to, I'm the guy that does what everybody else does, which is, you know, fudges my hours. The firm benefits, everybody, everybody benefits, everybody's doing it. The hardest thing about behaving ethically is that human beings are unbelievably good about rationalizing their behavior after the fact. You can actually convince yourself, and I can convince myself, that by not putting down those extra 22 hours that year, I actually did something wrong. Yeah. I screwed over my firm, I screwed over my kids, I screwed over, um, I even hurt my client because I took December. You can make up whatever you want in mind. You can see like, you know what, the reason you're not billing those hours isn't because the client doesn't need you to do work, it's because you're, you like having the ability to chill out around the holidays. You know, you want it to be home for Hanukkah every night to light the lights for one year, right? You can convince yourself that what you did was wrong, was not only right, it was the rightest thing you could have done. And that's the hardest part about ethics. And that's the hardest part about behaving the way that you need to do. So how do we how do we do it? How does a lawyer do it? How does anybody that wants to behave the right way do it? Very simple. One second, Moshe. Very simple. You have to realize that in the long term, 
cheaters don't prosper. In the long term, everything's going to even out. That whatever you take that doesn't really belong to you, Hashem's going to find a way to give it back. Right? You'll get a ticket. You'll, you'll, you know, you'll, something will happen. And that if you want to feel good about yourself and you want to have the energy and the strength to keep doing what you're doing year in and year out and be excited about it and be proud of yourself for doing it, you really have no other option. The only option is to say, you know what? This year, I'm not going to build 2,000 hours. This year, I'll, I'll take the hit, you know? And we'll see how it works out. And that's the hard, but I'm telling you, it is worth it. Because if you can't stand up and look in the mirror at the end of the day, at the end of the year, or at the 50 years of practicing law and say, you know what? I may not have been the best lawyer. I didn't win every motion. Not every client liked me. The people that worked with me thought I was a big pain. You know, the other lawyers on the side all hated me. No one liked to deal with me because I was always a stickler. It doesn't matter. The only person that's going to be looking back in the mirror is yourself. So, and believe me, what you're going to remember is you're going to remember the times where you failed ethically a lot more than all the times that you did the right thing. So the best way to go about things is to remember there's a hierarchy. No matter what we do, we always have different levels of responsibility to other people. Sometimes that is to a client, sometimes it's to our family, sometimes it's to God. You always, before you do anything that seems challenging, you always have to ask yourself, am I doing this because my self-interest tells me that this is the right thing for me to do? And I'm, I'm willing to forget my responsibilities, all my other responsibilities? Or am I taking into account everybody else's responsibilities and my responsibilities to everybody else, and I'm doing the right thing because I'd rather be that person than the other guy. So. Uh, could you just tell us a, a minute or two about your journey? Like, how do you become oh, sure. a, did you have to do engineering? How do you become a... Okay, so it's a good question. So I graduated from here. Um, I went to NYU. While I was in NYU, I, I actually was pre-med, so I was taking a lot of science classes. And um, I ultimately decided to go to law school. I went, when I was in law school, I... I knew I liked intellectual property. I liked the idea that it's all kind of made up, but it's all it's super important to the economy because the value of everything nowadays is actually in brand names as opposed to uh, products, right? right? When you can buy anything for cheap from China, what's, what makes it different, right? Um, and I took a lot of courses in IP, and my law school, I went to the Yeshiva University Cardozo, and they actually have a track where you get a, like a special certificate at graduation that you, you know, focused on IP law, so I did that. Um, so the way it really works is law school's three years, right? Uh, the first year, every law school in the country, you learn the same thing, the same core classes, criminal law, constitutional law, property torts, contracts, you know, all that stuff, uh, an ethics class, a legal writing class. Basically, all the law firms want to be able to compare the lawyers from different schools. Obviously, you know that a kid from Harvard might have more ability than a kid from Brooklyn Law School. but you want the kid from Brooklyn Law School to have a chance because the kid that gets all A's at Brooklyn Law School might actually be smarter than the kid that's at the bottom of his class at Harvard. So th there's a lot of there's a lot of nuance there, but everybody has to learn the basics. Then in your first summer, most most schools tell you you go intern. So I worked for a judge in Freehold because I didn't want to I didn't want to commute. Um, and you you basically work for free. You get some experience working somewhere. At the end of your first summer they have what we call OCI, which is great. It's like the NFL draft, it's so much fun. You, all the firms come to the law school, right? And they, you apply to meet with them, to be interviewed by them, and then they decide who they want to interview. Now, if you go to Harvard, you're gonna have every law firm from around the country coming to meet with you because everybody wants Harvard kids. If you're at a regional school like Yeshiva University, you're probably gonna have all the major New York firms, and you might have, but you're not really likely to have the Los Angeles office of some firm come to meet you. But still, there's plenty of firms, right? So let's say, now, it all depends on how you did your first year. If you had good grades, you're gonna get a lot of interviews. If you have bad grades, you might not get any interviews, right? 
Um, and the whole point is that you interview with the firms. You have a, they meet you on campus. Hey, Rob, what's up? They, they, they meet you on campus, and um, you have a, like a 15-minute session with one of the lawyers, and then they call you back to the firm to a second round of interviews. They might take you for lunch, you might meet with two or three lawyers. And the whole point at the end of the day is you want to get out of there and you want to have offers from different firms. Ideally, you have more than one offer, so you could decide, do I want to play for the Falcons or do I want to play, you know, double A ball? It's a different story. So that's the way it works. The next summer, and they're hiring you for the end of your second year. So your second year of law school, you're taking all electives, you're focusing on the things that you like, and then you go to work in the summer. And it's great. They pay you like they pay their first year lawyers. So um, you could be making a few thousand dollars a week. And they're trying to impress you. So they take you to baseball games, they take you to plays, they take you, you go out for dinner or lunch every day. They don't really give you any work to do. It's kind of like your reward. It's like the reward summer. They want you to think that when you come work at this law firm, you're going to be the happiest guy in the world. And they kind of like lock the doors of all the other junior associates that are working well so much so you don't see them. Right? You're only meeting with partners. They, they, they put on a good show. right? Now, when I was in school, it used to be that unless you like took a bottle of vodka at a party and bashed it over a partner's head, the firm you worked for in your second summer would be the firm you worked for after you graduated law school. Now it's become a lot more competitive. There's a lot fewer associate positions to start. So, you know, depending on the firm, there may be only 50% of the class. So they may bring in 30, you know, second year lawyers, second year students. They spend the summer and then they'll give an offer for 50. The ones that are lucky and get that offer, you have your whole third year of law school, you already know you have a job waiting for you in September. So it's heaven, right? You get to finish off law school, it's easy. You finish law school, you prepare for the bar, you take the bar in the summer, and then you start work in September at this crazy $150,000 a year, $160,000 a year salary. It's pretty nice. Now, to get there, there's a lot of hard work, and like I said, depending on what school you're in, depending how well you do, I mean, you could be one of 20 kids in your grade that has that opportunity, but that, that is what it is. And then you start working, and depending on the firm you're working for, some firms allow you to kind of start in a specific department. And there's other firms that believe that, no, the best way to start off young lawyers is to rotate, rotate them through. So you spend six months in tax, six months in real estate, six months in litigation, six months in IP. And then after two or three years, then you decide. So the firm I worked for is, it was called Greenberg Charg. It's one of the 10 biggest firms in the world. Um, and they, they believed in the first approach. So they, when I was hired, I was specifically hired to work on patent litigation. I was specifically hired to work on pharma patent litigation because I had pre-med and research experience at NYU. Um, so I was, I, I was literally hired, and I'll tell you the reason I was hired, you're never gonna believe it. The reason I was hired was because I spoke Hebrew. And the case, because the case they were working on and the case they needed a young lawyer on involved Teva, which is an Israeli generic company. So they thought that they were gonna be getting a lot of documents from Teva in Hebrew. Right? And that they would need to go to Israel and stuff like that. So it turns out we didn't see a single document in Hebrew the whole case. It turns out that when we had to do depositions of people in Israel, they all spoke better English than the lawyers here. It turns out it didn't really matter, but you know, Haseh Hashem, I was hired because I spoke Hebrew. That, that's what Hashem wanted me to be. So the, it doesn't matter. What I, part of what you guys have to understand is you do the work, you do the work, and you kill yourself, and it's all so you're in a position to get lucky. And when we say get lucky, we mean that when Hashem can put you where you need to be, okay? So all, after all that effort, that's why I got hired, and then from there, I started working on other cases, and you know, eventually I made a partner, and then I, w I went to another firm as a partner, and then I opened my own firm, and, and that's how I'm here today. But the, the journey, like, like Schiffer says, the journey is, is a pretty standard one in the beginning, but at each level, it's just, you're going into another tournament, right? If you guys think high school's a tournament, right? That there's gonna be 10 kids that get into the Ivy League schools from here, and everybody else is gonna have to figure out what they're gonna do for, for themselves. It's not, it's the same thing. When you're, when you're in college, it's another tournament. What, what, who's gonna get into the best law school, right? Because everything is, uh, uh, what's that, capacity control, right? Even if you go to NYU for undergraduate, 
NYU Law School, which is a top five law school, may only take one or two kids from NYU a year. That might be their quota. So you have to be, of all the pre-law students at NYU, you're going to have to be one of the top two. Right? And, the way that, and then you go to law school. And then law school's a tournament. Everybody's taking the same grades. Everybody's taking the same classes in the first year. And you have to be in the top 10% or top 20% of your class. Otherwise, you're not going to get those interviews. Right? And then, so you do that. Then you get hired by a firm. And then what? Guess what? There's a tournament again. There's, there's 40 kids that are starting with you. You're all class of 2001. And by the time you get to 2009, 95% of you are not going to be there. And one of the 40 is going to make partner. It's the way, the way it is, right? So um, let me tie it back to ethics. What I have seen, and I'll tell you this honestly, is there's two ways to win the tournament from an ethical perspective. The good way is to always be the ethical guy, to be the guy that's the Kiddush Hashem, that the guy that everybody respects because when they see that you're leaving early on Friday, they know you're going to be back in the office Sunday morning when no one else is in the office to make up for the time you miss. Or that when you take off for a holiday, you make sure that everything that needed to get done is taken care of. And then when it comes time for Christmas and, and New Year's, you're the one that's in the office Christmas Eve working so someone else can be with their family. That, that, okay. That's one way to do it. The other way to do it, and this is the way I don't recommend doing it, but, it, but the reality, and this goes back to choosing to prosper, is to be the most unethical person in the world. Those are, those are the two types of people that win these tournaments. Right? It, the guy that's a backstabber, the guy that lies about how many hours they work, the guy that does everything like that, you would, that steals notes. We had people that would go in the library and rip pages out of the library books that people had to study for. Because they thought that the teacher's only going to give one A in the class, so if everybody else gets to study, <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not going to be the one to get the A. So, and those are the people that succeed. It's the, 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 the valedictorian of my law school class was the most unethical, evil young woman I ever met in my life. She was nasty. She was nasty to everybody. Now, turns out, I don't think she ever made it. Because after a certain amount of time, being as unethical as you could be catches up with you. Right? I mean, look at it, look at what we're seeing in the news today with all these people and all these powerful people. Hi. It might be when you're 80 years old, but it's going to catch up to you. So that's the reality of, of business. There's always going to be that idea that I could follow the path of being a really nasty guy, and there's always going to be the idea that I could follow the path of being a really good guy. My recommendation even though it might require some deferred gratification, is to try to follow the path of being a good guy. Because in the end, it'll work out. And oh, by the way, I didn't even mention this. That year, I got a bonus anyway. Because they said you only had 19, you said you only missed by 22 hours. The, the, the head of the department called me in. He said, look, if we took your average hours over the last five or six years, it's well over 2,000. There's no, we don't want you to leave this firm, and we're not going to let uh, whatever, I don't know how much it was, it was a decent amount of money, probably is that uh, $20,000, $30,000, maybe a little bit more. We're not going to let that make you feel bad about working here. We know it wasn't your fault that all your cases settled, right? So you're going to be on it. And not only that, he went so far as to say, don't think that this is going to hurt you when it comes time to voting on you for partner. It's, it's going to do the opposite. Now, I didn't expect that. I thought the rule was the rule, right? You have a rule. So 2,000 hours. You didn't do it, you didn't do it. I made the decision. I'm not going to do it this way. Uh, but at the end of the day, when you do the right thing, the right thing starts happening your way too. Yeah. Well, let's say you do like good work in a little time. Right. The difference. You, there, I know a lot of lawyers that, because they're too efficient, don't get the same credit that they deserve. Now, you can make up for it, right? Let's say you're the greatest lawyer there they ever saw at the firm. And what takes everybody 10 hours, you can do in two hours. The way to make up for it is everybody is going to realize that you're the good one. And they're going to start giving you more work. So you're going to have to make up for it in volume. Same thing as any, right? If you, you, know, you average two yards a carry, or five yards to carry, right? You might need more carries to get to where you have to do. So it's, it's a lot harder. You might burn out a lot faster. But that's you got to work with what you can work with. But it, the point is, 
you have to learn the rules, and you have to learn the culture, and you have to learn to work within the culture of the place that you're at, too. You never want to be too much on the extremes of anything. So if you work at a firm where everybody comes in at 10, which a lot of lawyers do, they come in late, and they stay late. So let's say your normal day is 10 to 8. I've seen people that are like, oh, I'm going to come in at 8 o'clock. Guess what? They come in at 8 o'clock every day, and they leave at 6, and everybody thinks they're slackers because no one's there at 8 o'clock to see them. So they come in at 8, they leave at 6. All anybody ever sees is that you're left at 6 o'clock. So we had a guy. Guy's nickname was 6 o'clock blank. That's what we called him. And he was a great lawyer, and he used to come in early every day. But when he was there, no one else was there. So no one, he never got the credit. So, so all right. But be smart. You have, no one's, you see, that's the problem. When you're in a tournament, no one's trying to help you. No one's going to give you that good advice. No one's going to pull you over and say, you know, by the way, you're better off going to gym, the gym in the morning and show up at 10 o'clock when everybody else does than coming at 8 because no one's noticing you at 8, right? No one's giving you that advice. It's a tournament. You're going to succeed based on somebody else's failure. Is it, yeah. Is it unethical to not give me advice? Okay, so that's that's a good that's a good question. That goes to okay. So in our hierarchy of responsibilities, he's not your client, he's not you, he's not your family. Um, he he is your coworker. So I would say it's on a low level. I would say that someone that did that would be uh, basically a really good person, right? And when we talk about ethics, we try not to just do what we need to do, we try to go above and beyond, because that's where you get into the range of, right? You want to avoid Kilu Hashem, but you also want to be a Kiddush Hashem. So if you go to him and say, look, buddy, you know, I, I was at a meeting, and I heard the partners talking about you, and everybody's commenting how you're leaving so early, um, I, it's a nice thing to do. Are you required to do it? I don't know. Right? I don't know. It depends. If it's someone you never, you don't know, um, maybe your ethical obligation tends a little bit lower. If, but if it's another religious guy who you know has four kids and is paying yeshiva tuition and really needs the job, you might be, you might be a little bit more you know, forthcoming. That's okay. It's okay to be ethical in terms of assessing different weights to the responsibilities you have, right? So if you want to prefer, I don't care what business you're here. If you say, look, I'm a Jew and I, I prefer to give business to other Jews. That's okay, that's not unethical. That's not discriminatory to say that, for me, it's important to try to help other people that are like me, right? That, that's okay, that's okay. Doesn't mean you're allowed to you know, not pay a non-Jew that does work for you, of course not, right? That, that's the, the other extreme. So it's a good question. It's, I, I think you, you basically have to make the decision in the moment. 